This is probably the most important picture ever taken. It's about 50 years old, and it was taken by an astronaut called Bill Anders. Bill was an astronaut on the Apollo 8 mission. And the task for Apollo 8 was, for the first time in history, leave Earth's orbit and travel to the moon. Not land on the moon, but circumnavigate the moon and take pictures for the next Apollo missions to see where they would land. So Bill was taking pictures from the moon, from the backside of the moon in the spaceship, coming to the front, and then suddenly Earth rose. And this is a picture we all know very well. But this is how it's always been published. Actually, Bill took the picture like this. And I always wonder, was it too scary? Was it too scary to see Earth in this vast expanse of black space being so fragile? And it's that view of Earth, standing back, looking back at Earth, that really changes astronauts. A lot of astronauts, they really had kind of a, a cognitive change. And they became, after their astronaut careers, they became active environmentalists. And I somehow went through a little bit of the same change. I also had to go to space. I went even further. I went to Mars. And this is a picture from Mars looking back at Earth. Earth is just a little speck in the sky. This is taken by the Curiosity rover on Mars. Now, I'm not an astronaut obviously, and um, I'm an architect, so the closest I'm going to get to Mars is to design something on Mars. This is what I did. I developed a habitat for Mars, and it was part of the NASA's Centennial Challenge. Now, you might think, well, you know, space, space habitats, that's kind of tricky, that's kind of technical and complex. What does an architect like me has anything to do with that? Well, you know, I... Kind of back to differ, this is inside the International Space Station. This is where the astronauts live for six months. I think a bit of architecture and design could help them. <laughs> and look, architects and designers have been involved in space. This is Skylab, 1973. It's the first time that NASA had an orbital space station. The first time astronauts were not traveling through space for like hours or few days. No, they were going to stay in space for weeks and months. They were going to inhabit space. So NASA employed this guy, Raymond Loewy. Now, Raymond was a very important and influential industrial, American industrial designer. And NASA didn't want him to actually design the space station. No, no, no. They asked him just to evaluate the arrangement plan, uh, the lighting, the noise levels, and the color scheme, just to evaluate it. And the engineers were a bit skeptical about him, this designer dude, because, you know, what is he coming to do in our field? This is, this is rocket science. This is serious. No need to make it look pretty, right? Well, he did change the colors. I have to say that. But he did two more things, which were, I think, pretty fundamental. First of all, he designed the astronauts a table. You might think, well, is that so special? Well, in the original design, the engineers gave the astronauts each a little tray that folded out from the side of the spaceship, and they would just have their meal facing the wall of the spaceship, sitting right next to each other. No way to have a communication, a, a discussion. No way to talk about how their day went over a meal. I think it's kind of human uh, necessity to do that. Second thing, and you'll see that in the back. It's a little round window. Now, in the original design, the engineers didn't think it was necessary to have a window. Raymond Lowy was really, really hard to get that window in there. Because the engineers thought, well, it's just a, a weakness in the shell of the, of, of the spaceship. We don't really need it. Imagine being an astronaut in Skylab, going around Earth for months at a time, and never seeing the view of this. Now, we didn't design for a space station in orbit. We designed for Mars. Now, Mars is pretty tricky. Let me try to explain it. What you see there is, in relative terms, on scale, the distance between Earth and the Moon. Right? Now, 
I want to put Mars on that slide as well, but my slide isn't big enough. So um, actually, if I put Mars on it, I wouldn't even get it in this room. I would actually put Mars on this scale about 10 kilometers away, somewhere around Brighton Beach here in Melbourne. So it took Apollo astronauts three days to go to the moon. It will take our astronauts months to get to Mars, probably just under a year. Now, with that distance comes a cost. It's hugely expensive. And that cost is directly related to the amount of stuff you bring, to the mass and the volume. Now, designing on Mars, we gave ourselves three design principles. Right. First thing was, let's try to design with materials, with local materials. Right? If we don't need to take it with us, it doesn't cost us anything. Second, let's bring as little as possible. Let's pack light. And third, let's reuse and recycle as much as we can. Now, we're not the first pioneers that thought that. These guys thought the same thing. American pioneers going west, going to the next frontier. They were also traveling light, just taking some tents and some carriages and probably some, some tools. And once they arrived, they lived off the land. They used local material, what was wood in this case. And they only probably had an ax and a saw with them. So they could only do basic stuff. So the most basic way to build their habitats was by stacking the logs on top of each other. Very simple way of doing that. They didn't need any complex woodwork. They didn't need any nails or anything like that. Now, what do we have on Mars? What are our resources? Well, dust, loads of dust. We call it regolith, Martian regolith. And we're going to do the same thing. What we're going to do is we're going to stack that regolith on top of each other. We're going to 3D print it. But as you see, I didn't bring a massive 3D printer to Mars. Remember, I'm traveling light, packing light. So we just have small robotic printers, a swarm system of robots working together. The first one goes and tries to find the right regolith on this Martian landscape. The second one comes in and starts digging for it. And once it's dug enough of regolith, it brings it to our construction site. And once that happens, we'll get the 3D printing. These robots then lay down the regolith, melt it through microwaves, and sinter it layer by layer. Now, this structure we've just designed and just built, that's not the habitat yet. That is just our uh, protection shield against radioactive gamma radiation that comes from the sun and from the cosmos. So what we do is we bring lightweight habitats that we pop underneath this shell. These are lightweight, they're packed up and they inflate. And these, in a ring, they form the habitat for the astronauts. Now, when we had this visualization done by an artist, um, I noticed something. She kind of used some artistic freedom, and in the bottom right, you see there's a whole bunch of robots doing nothing. Now, I suddenly think, oh my god, did we just create the first junkyard on Mars? That's terrible. So, back to the drawing board, right? Because these robots should not just do one thing. We redesigned them as kind of a Lego system of, of robots. They could come together, uh, make a digging robot, make a printing robot, and after they've done doing that, well, they can make another system. Here, for example, this is a transportation system. They come together, all huddled together, and a platform that can take up our pots, our inflatable pots, and bring them down to the site. Using these three principles, we didn't just use those for our habitats, right? No, we use them for the stuff inside as well. And I see you all thinking already, kind of what you said, you were going to travel light. What are these big sofas doing there? You know, that's not light. That's not small. Um, and you're right. We actually didn't bring them. Um, we started to collaborate with different designers. So we started to collaborate with Nagami, a small um, startup, design and technology startup that 3D prints chairs and furniture. And we're imagining that we're going to 
use this system to, on Mars, print our own furniture. But new plastics? No, we're going to use recycled plastics because there will be loads of packaging material. We rework them and 3D print stuff for in the habitat. And you see it in the back that a 3D printer busy uh, printing some new chairs. But we thought we can even go further, right? Uh, we were thinking, what will the astronauts wear, for example? Well, um, we started to working with Christopher Rayburn. He's a fashion designer in London, and he's really interested in remaking clothes from existing materials. For example, this jacket I'm wearing, this is actually made out of old German uh, rain ponchos, right? Um, and so what will we do on Mars? Well, the jacket you see, the orange jacket, that's actually made out of parachutes. Parachutes that were used to land stuff on the Martian surface. Now, designing on Mars, we had to be super sustainable. We really had to think hard and really think of everything. We had to make sure we did everything super light. We had to make sure that we used local materials and we had to make sure that we recycled and reused. And let me just leave you with this one thought tonight. What if we used those principles and took them really serious on Earth? What if we really designed with light materials and as few material as possible? What if we were serious about using local resources to build our buildings? And what if we were reusing and recycling to the max? What would our buildings and our cities look like then? Thank you.